introduction. Um, as said, I am Tom Cormier, the President and CEO of Parliamentary Centre. And for those of you unfamiliar, Parliamentary Centre is Canada's oldest and most experienced nonpartisan organization that is dedicated to supporting inclusive legislatures and accountable dem democratic institutions here in Canada and worldwide. We've worked in over 120 legislatures in over 70 countries and the list keeps growing. We believe that parliaments are absolutely essential to better development outcomes. Parliamentary Centre has been working in Myanmar since 2013 at the national and subnational level in a variety of ways to strengthen legislatures through a number of initiatives that include strengthening women's political voice, increasing financial oversight, encouraging peaceful resolution of challenges, and strengthening research capacity in parliaments. I had the honour to collaborate on Parliamentary Centre's first project in Myanmar, where I served as the first country representative of international idea from 2012 to 2015. Competent subnational governance is key, is a key for the future of a decentralized and potentially federal Myanmar. Our last project, supported by the IDRC, focused on introducing the Shan State Luta to the value and nature of legislative research. Our implementing partner was Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation, with whom we still enjoy a very positive working relationship. I'd like to introduce you to our key speakers, who will tell you more about the initiative and generate a good discussion. Mr. Ivo Balanov is our Director of Partnerships and Program Development at the, at the Parliamentary Centre. He'll reflect on the lessons learned and new opportunities to build capacity for gender sensitive policy making in Myanmar. And I'd like to also introduce Miate Tsar, a friend of mine and doctoral candidate in political science at the University of Massachusetts uh, and an MREF strategic advisor. She will discuss the findings from the updated MREF report on performance analysis on subnational parliaments. And without further ado, because I know you're all here to hear them, I would turn it over to Miate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh uh, to both Agat and uh, Tom. So let me just quickly start with uh, some uh, brief background information on the subnational parliaments, or we also call Lutos in uh, Myanmar. So we have um, 14 uh, subnational parliaments, seven states parliaments and seven regional parliaments. So following the 2010 general elections, all these parliaments came to, came to exist in uh, 2011 and became like one of the pillars of subnational governance system uh, structure by uh, 2008 constitution. So contrary to the union level legislative structure at subnational level, all of these legisl legislatures are unicameral legislatures. That means some of the elected MPs perform dual role playing MP role in parliaments as well as taking a minister uh, position in the cabinet, right? So, but in this second term, Pluto, percentage of MPs who takes dual role significantly reduce. So the data like maybe is here for your quick look. Uh, okay. So that, I mean, so subnational parliaments of Myanmar practice um, legislative and uh, uh, the oversight uh, power granted by uh, 2008 constitution and specifically the schedule two and schedule five of 2008 constitution. So it's defined their legislative power. So here is, um, is a, a snapshot for you uh, for your quick view. So after the 2008 um, um, so let let me uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, after the 2008 um, general elections, NLD became the leading party in 12 out of 14 states and region parliaments. So it's take up like uh, over three quarters of the elected uh, seats. So one important thing to remember is like in union level lutos, military representatives also take 25% of the seats in all states and region parliaments, right? And what about ethnic political parties? So ethnic-based political parties cover total 13% of seats, 
for the whole country and in states parliament they obviously cover more seats that is 32 percent and in regions they receive very minimal um, uh, share so that is a uh, one percent right due to the nld's uh, popularity so interestingly in a uh, previous term one usdp was leading party ethnic based political party took up more seats that is 16 percent for the whole country And uh, we have women. Uh, to currently 13% in states and region parliaments. So, okay, now let me move on to uh, the legislative and oversight effectiveness. So one of the significant um, pre-legislative improvements, we can say that of these uh, current laws, is that uh, public consultation is being well practiced in uh, several parliaments we study. So we also be, are also reported not only by parliamentarians, but more importantly uh, by local CSOs and local media we interview. So we found that most of the public hearing and consultation were conducted when bills were in the hands of bill committee. So according to the data, we can say five out of nine study letters have conducted consultation and hearing, uh, public hearing, like um, um, though the, the maybe the frequency may be like vary. So we have this uh, um, a data here. Yeah, this is just a quick uh, look for you. And so let me move on to the next slide. Um, um, so we have, um, let, let me just give you one good example that can highlight the potential of subnational parliaments for decentralization and enhancement of democratic uh, representation. So soon after the second term parliaments were activated, several parliaments started putting effort uh, to prepare new uh, state and region municipal laws with the purpose of restructuring the existing municipal committees which mostly were formed with uh, appointed members. So between mid 2016 and late 2017, in five out of nine study lutos have enacted new municipal laws and another two have amended the existing laws. So due to this legislative efforts, either to have like a news law or amended municipal laws, the municipal committees of towns, townships and state and region are now formed with majority elected members. So most of the local CSOs and the media inform their experience of more efficient and transparent municipalities in their localities. So next slide. So Moon State uh, fishery law case is another good example, but um, this is the unique uh, example of that kind. Uh, so that actually gives us a perspective of how can actually create wider parliaments can make for freshwater fishery. So what most state parliament did is just give a twist between like union and local fishery law and putting the title just as fishery law, avoiding specificities in the name. So the law was approved and not being implemented. So but Tanindai region like taking similar steps to Moon, but their fishery law making cannot like um, move forward. So next slide. So we also see some of these like effectiveness in a legislative and oversight in terms of like committee's uh, efforts. So definitely we can see like legislative committees of all in-depth study letters are improved through degree of improvements may vary, you know. Um, so several oversight committees, we can say that improved. 
So among the committees that particularly work on um, budget oversight and public finance are reported as the ones with ov obvious improvements. So such committees are not headed mostly by, are now headed, I mean, sorry, headed mostly by progressive committee chair with some background qualities on budgeting and finance. In addition, these committees take support from external experts who play roles in either part of the, the, the budget committee or part of an, an expert support commission that are usually formed within the formal structures of subnational parliaments. So one significant oversight action is also found in most state parliament. So the Oversight Committee of Public Budget Review and Finance, Planning and Economic Issues investigated through a, a research on investment projects implemented and allowed uh, by union level and state level investment commission. All study documents. Inform about investment projects by Union Investment Commission. So according to committee report of the Mon State Parliament, about 70% of projects were invested by the approval of Union Commission, and also some projects have posed obvious negative impacts on local communities and um, environments. But Mon State Government is not able to answer when the Parliament's requested information about these projects. So the parliament put effort through research as they want to make evident base oversight even to union level institutions. Okay, let me now uh, quickly move to structural barriers. How much time do I have? Okay, I should continue. The biggest uh, constitutional barrier for subnational parliaments come from the obscureness of the 2008 constitution. So all study looters talk about that one phrase. And I selected the best quote referring to what the deputy speaker of Mon State Parliament said. So all these powers of states and regions are in vain due to this one phrase in accordance with the law enacted by the union. So that phrase is really important. So where does that phrase come from? So that phrase is put on all 45 areas that were added to the subnational legislative list of the Schedule II of the Constitution by the law amending the Constitution approved by the Union Parliament in mid-2015 that was under previous government, Utay Sain's government. So even though the areas were added to Schedule II, state and region parliaments cannot do anything due to that phrase. That's why we have heard that all these burn up feeling from uh, our parliamentarians, like what I mentioned here. So they give us, but not in a way to get, you know, that was by the speaker of kind And even Kine stated that as beyond the, the union level seems grabbing all till the end. So what can we do more? So generally, we can say that regional parliaments tend to have more royalty to the union than states, do right? So let alone states, people from region even feel like that. So next slide. The, the land revenue, yes. So again, uh, the case of this notorious land revenue law reported that the union still keeps some important areas that are already given to states and regions through the schedule of the constitution. As a result, despite the fact that land revenue was approved in 12 out of 14 states and regions, it cannot be implemented yet. So most state parliament submitted to the case to the constitutional tribunal in 2013 and constitutional tribunal was not able to answer. And thus the case was submitted again to the president. Then the president uh, Utain saying for his advice. So he just replied to wait until the laws.
so we more or less similarly we have several legislative efforts are pending some are due to the vagueness in terms of definitions made by union level laws and some of these definitions made by union level ministries are also found shortfalls so all these serve as barriers for subnational legislations so and one important point i don't want to miss is about the management of surplus budget um is the brief still in the previous slide uh, budget uh, by state and region government um, more specifically that authority is just in the hands of chief ministers according to the state and region government law so these surplus budgets are currently supposed not to be reviewed by subnational parliaments and chief ministers can use these funds in any areas of local developments so in some study parliaments the respondent reported that this is the area which high risk of corruption committed by chief ministers and pointed out examples of like uh, this uh, two famous corruption case of uh, chief ministers in tenendai region and recently in kaya state okay next slide i have um, uh, major recommendations uh, i have several here but uh, due to the time limitation uh, we just go to some key recommendations First, the leading party or like parties of power should put great effort to end or abolish land sensitive union level laws such as land revenue law and like excise uh, revenue law so the current constitutional amendment effort was and so how it will it is is making it impossible to amend right so why we are hoping to get some significant breakthrough through peace like dialogue the panel conference um so whatever we call it the government in power can also put effort to do what what they can do like picking the low hanging fruits first and we can put more power to the states that will to some extent help address their demands for equal power sharing so another important point is the role of constitutional tribunal here so but i put more hope to the plan of establishing a new constitutional court that is part of the key outcomes achieved in last pinlo um the the union peace conference so the structure and mandate of that constitutional court are extremely important as we just simply learned that the existing constitutional tribunal is not more than a showcase so next important uh, recommendation is uh, is an effective um, coordination mechanism uh, between union and state and region lotto should be formed we need a better coordination body than the current uh, mpu so the main purpose is the the, the effective and like um, also to conduct a uh, consultation you know um public hearings etc so and we also importantly found through the study is that one support from csos and international organizations um are active like all these engagement activities are all like uh, are more like frequently happen so the role of lotto officers and um, also very much important they also have that lack of like a capacity um and uh, the the limitations like so this what the study found is that uh, little officers are much struggling for human resources um and also due to the limited budget and hierarchical structure of that um the recruitment process so it is quite a challenge for them to recruit a, a skillful like a uh, lot of support staffs so international donors should consider providing funding for lot of intern programs and nurture like young generations to have skills interests 
and spirit to work for local legislatures. So I suppose the trained intent um, graduated from like intent program should join the formal recruitment process and but they, they can also get more chance uh, to receive the permanent and uh, relevant position at this slot. So this is actually the idea uh, is not my idea. This is an idea given by one of the experienced uh, head of the Luto office. OK, so let me stop here and um, I want to invite my friend Evo to continue the presentation. Evo is mute. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I will be very brief so that we can leave more time for um, a discussion session after that. Um, what I wanted to talk about is the Parliamentary Centre's experience under a recent project um, that took place under K4DM in Shan State. And it focused on parliamentary research. As you hear, as you heard from Mia Tess, the communication one would be what is parliamentary research and why is it needed. And the second one, I will in the second one, I'll provide a few key highlights from my experience in Myanmar. The organization that I represent, the Parliamentary Center, was actually born 52 years ago from the need to address um, the need for research and analysis in Canada's own federal parliament. Um, scroll forward 52 years, we have now worked with about 120 parliaments in more than 70 countries worldwide at both national and subnational levels. Um, and even though we focus on a lot more areas than parliamentary research, parliamentary research is something that comes up all the time. It's a perennial need. And the reason for that um, is that parliamentarians need independent nonpartisan research and analysis to be able to perform their roles, to look at legislation, to look at how is it implemented. Um, a lot in most parliaments around the world, a good chunk of the legislation of the draft laws come from the executive and the executive branch of government develops those based on the views of their experts of the information that they have and on their partisan platform and bias. Parliaments on the other hand, a multi-party and they have the role to scrutinize in you know in a in a different way from a different angle what is presented by the government so it's very important that they have independent non-partisan knowledge and information to be able to perform this role next slide please so what we did in Myanmar under K4DM um, the parliamentary center in partnership with the Inlanded Myanmar Research Foundation um, focused on introducing um, chance, the Shan State Luto, which is the country's biggest subnational legislature, to parliamentary research. The way we approach that is by starting with a train the trainers, which is where we introduce local civil society organizations, not only uh, the Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation, We put this into practice into in some trainings with the Shan State Luto, um, where we introduce the members and the staff to what is legislative research um, and discuss how it can be valuable for their work. And then we engage in very some very practical exercises where they identify topics that they're working on and we took them to the research process and they were able to get something at the end that was applicable to their work. The third stage of the process was focusing on helping the Shan State Luto to look in the longer term on how to lay the foundations about developing an institutionalized research service. And this is where we help them to develop an actual plan on how do you build that over the course of several years. Um, and we also focused on developing a manual on parliamentary research trainings, which I will cover in a bit more detail in a minute. Next slide, please. 
So a few highlights from, from this process that I described. Um, for many parliamentarians that we worked with and for staff, uh, parliamentary research was, was a new concept. Even a research methodology was a new concept. The fact that there are Myanmar language resources available that they can look, uh, they can find and examine was new. Um, but as soon as, as we introduced them to this and we went through the process of doing the exercises, some of them were very, very quick to put that in their work into practice to the benefit of their constituents. And a good example was um, Don Nan San San Aye, who had in her constituency a community that was separated by a river that was difficult and, and dangerous to cross. The government had pointed to the fact that building a conventional bridge would be too expensive. Um, so Don Nan San San Aye used her research skills and she undertook some research to find out what options are there for building a bridge. And she found that there is a particular type of a ferry bridge that is not so expensive and it can be a solution for this community. And based on that, she was able to pers persuade the state government or respective minister that this is a solution and this was included in, in the state budget. Um, so the government undertook to actually address the, the challenge for her constituents. So this is an example of how, you know, th despite of all of the limitations that subnational parliaments are dealing with, uh, you know, uh, research skills were actually able to make a difference in the life of regular people. Next slide, please. Um, another aspect um, of, of what we did, and as I mentioned, is that we work together with the Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation, and we did a sort of a train, train the trainers for them on parliamentary research. Then we did we work together on some trainings in Shan State Luto, but when they were through this process, then they were able to go on their own. Subsequently, under the later stages of the project, they, they started leading some research exercises themselves with the Shan State Luto. But more importantly, they were approached by other parliaments, other subnational parliaments in Myanmar, and they were able to also attract the resources, I think, from the Asia Foundation to offer an interest. Um, another important highlight was that once we, once we took the members and the staff of the Shan State Luto to some initial research exercises, there was a quick realization of the value of this. Um, and there was an agreement um, from all parties in, in parliament that this is something that the institution needs in the long run. So we worked together, uh, we took the, the staff and the members through a facilitated process where they developed their own plan, an operational plan, of how to develop a research service over the course of five years. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, the plan identified what is it that can be done with our own resources, but also where external support is needed, you know, both from international actors, but also from other parts of the country, including the union parliament, that it may have some relevant experience and resources to share. Um, so we shared this with local international stakeholders in order to be able to attract the support to carry forward. Um, this was the first time something like that was done in Myanmar, and it did attract the attention of other subnational parliaments, and it's becoming a model that there is an interest to replicate elsewhere. Um, the last thing I would mention was the Parliamentary Research Training Manual. Um, that we developed. And this is not a manual on how to conduct parliamentary research. There's plenty of those. Uh, it's a manual on how to help parliaments develop research capacity. And in that sense, it was first of its kind. Um, I should mention here that as we focused on parliamentary research, we did focus on, on the issue of being gender sensitive or meaning whenever you look at issues, you analyze issues, you have to consider the different ways in which women and men, girls and boys are impacted. So that this can be taken into account in the drafting of laws or overseeing the effects of the implementation of government programs. Um, this was included in this, in this research training manual. Um, we found um, to our pleasant surprise that 
this research manual, even though it was intended for Myanmar, it actually took it has attracted the attention of some other countries that we came across in very different parts of the world that came to us and told us that it's quite helpful for them as well. So naturally, was quite pleased of this outcome. Um, and we do hope, of course, that it will continue to be used in Myanmar, where we have just scratched the surface through our small project. Um, we worked with one subnational parliament out of 14. Next. I wanted to make a success validated by an external independent evaluation and, and such was commissioned, I think, by Global Affairs Canada um, of K4DM. And we're very happy to see that it recognized that the success of what we did in Chan State and its value, and it did recommend that it is something that, that is worth repeating and, and expanding. I will stop here and I think we can we can carry forward to that question and answer session.